Thank you for listening to the USGS Corecast. I'm Clarice Nassif Ransom. This interview about the Great Southern California Shakeout with USGS scientist Dr. Ken Hudnut was recorded on October 9, 2008. Ken, tell us a little bit about how a magnitude 7.8 earthquake on the Southern San Andreas Fault would impact the building structure 50 miles away in Los Angeles. Through the shakeout study, we've learned that the large ground motions from a big one on the San Andreas Fault would be large enough to potentially cause collapses of many tall buildings here in Los Angeles. Can you please describe how you came to the scientific conclusions about the building collapses? First, we defined the source of the Southern San Andreas earthquake very carefully, taking into account the research done over the past several decades on past earthquakes. We specified the source according to the physics of earthquakes as we understand them currently. We then gave that source model to each of four different groups that then modeled, simulated the ground motions. We used two of the nation's supercomputers in Pittsburgh and San Diego, and also the high-speed computer cluster at USC and at Caltech. And the results of those four simulations came in very close and with large ground motions throughout LA. We then had a panel of the world's leading experts, structural engineers who study tall buildings and who are very familiar with the seismically vulnerable types of tall buildings assess what the damage would be. And we actually put in the shakeout scenario a total of 10 building collapses, most of which occur right here in the downtown Los Angeles area. What is the most interesting piece of science that you've discovered through the scenario about the building structures? We set out in the ShakeOut study as one of our prime objectives to get a much more sure answer about the ground motions here in Los Angeles where we have tall buildings. And we've concluded through a very thorough investigation that the ground motions will be large enough to potentially cause collapses of tall buildings. We've seen around the world in other large earthquakes tall buildings collapse, older seismically vulnerable types, steel frames with brittle welds, and also reinforced concrete structures that just didn't use as much rebar as if it were built today. Ken, will you please describe the collaborative efforts that went on behind coming together on your conclusions? For ShakeOut, for the first time, we went through a process of calculating the ground motions and then reviewing those with structural engineers that was really unique. And prior to this study, we had had different differences of opinion about what the ground motions would be and whether tall buildings might collapse. What we achieved here was a new level of understanding of the ground motions and also agreement with structural engineering experts that tall building collapses are quite a realistic possibility and a big one on the San Andreas. Ken, the earthquake starts in the scenario around Bombay Beach. Tell us a little bit about from beginning to end what happens? How long does it take? Where, what cities along the San Andreas Fault does it impact? And anything else you'd like to share? As the earthquake progresses along the fault, first the waves are going to hit Palm Springs and the Coachella Valley within about 30 seconds. Damaging shaking will continue for about a minute there. And as that's occurring, the rupture keeps going. It hits San Bernardino next, shakes for about a minute there. After about a minute from the beginning of the earthquake, downtown LA is going to be shaken by about six feet per second kind of ground motions for a full minute. This damaging shaking is going to hit all of Southern California. It'll be felt all the way down even as far away as San Diego very strongly. So the pattern of shaking is concentrated along the fault, but even areas distant from the fault will receive damaging levels of shaking. Our sensors out along the Southern San Andreas Fault can pick up the waves as soon as they start to come off of the fault. We can then speed that information back to LA and provide over half a minute of early warning here in Los Angeles. Tell us a little bit how science and early warning can help the general public. The main thing we know we could do with an early warning system is trigger automated systems to shut off. We also know that school children who are very well trained on drop, cover, hold on drills will have time to react and get to a safe place if they're provided with an early warning alert. So those are our biggest hopes and we think that the technology is there and that this is something that could be done. So although we can't predict earthquakes, we can do early warning. 
Ken, tell me a little bit about what's been the most inspirational aspect about doing the science behind this. Really, it's been making that connection not only with emergency managers, but also with lifeline utilities operators. We're having conversations now that we just never had before. It's a, the result of the ShakeOut exercise. We know that people are taking actions to make the lifelines more secure, to retrofit, and to make Southern California safer for everybody in the event of a real earthquake. Thank you once again for checking out this episode of the USGS CoreCast. For links and more information, go to usgs.gov corecast and check out the show notes for this episode. CoreCast is a product of the U.S. Geological Survey, Department of the Interior. Until next time, I'm Clarice Nassif-Ransom. Have a great day.